Welcome to the show. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Riley. And today we are discussing the 2019 movie Joker for the second time. Oh. We'll laugh. We'll argue. We might get a little too into it, but at the end of the day, they're just movies. <laughs> That's very good. We're the show that Ebo Row 204 called A Great Ride While It Lasted in their five star review. And that, of course, is a little bit of a pun. <laughs> to our original name, Carpool Critics. Mm. Uh, next week, we will be doing nothing because this is the final episode. And for those not in the know, uh, this is a re recording. This is Joker Redux. Yeah. The first episode we ever recorded, which was never aired, was coverage of this movie. So we're doing it again now Ooh. that we're pros. We might actually play a segment or two of that first recording uh, uh, near the end of this episode. So stick around for that. It's on because it's on Flowplane. If you were subscribed to Flowplane, you may have seen this already. Mm. But uh, we didn't think it was fit for a uh, general release. <laughs> we knew it was not. We knew <laughs> it was not. That's true. Uh, we'll also probably take some time at the end to just shoot the shit about different feels that we're feeling. Mm. Um, but for now, David, what are you giving this movie out of 10? At its best, the Joker taps into some twisted feeling that connects the disenfranchised red-pilled to the echoes of broader frustration pushed to the forefront of society in the last decade. At its worst, it loses confidence in its audience intelligence and yells, We live in a society! <laughs> uh, 7.5 out of 10. 7.5? This is a good... There's, it's a good beginning and a good end. That was a... Uh, and a real sleepy middle. Oh, uh, yeah. And there's a lot of yelling of stupid stuff where they're like... Just stating things, and I'm like, it would be so much better if they just whispered things. Right, right. Like, this is what happens when you do this. Yeah, there's a lot of, or like newscasts that are like, society is boiling over right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it it is a comic book movie. Anyways, here's my slogan. Super um, rats. <laughs> uh, super rats. It's not a movie about the Joker. But a mesmerizing performance by Joaquin Phoenix elevates this taxi driver homage to s something something more elevated than that. Um, An homage. <laughs> my first time around, I gave this movie a 6.5 mm -hmm. uh, because it rubbed me the wrong way. But the second time through, I feel like I understood a little bit more of what the movie was trying to do. Anyways, I enjoyed it a bit more the second Great. time around. I'm giving, I'm upgrading it to a seven point two five. Nice, not a full point, but Almost. like I'm like, uh, okay, I, I see what you're doing there, mm. a little bit, but still kind of like disappointed overall in the fact that this is supposed to be a movie about the Joker and really it's about this guy. But we'll get into that, James. Say what you want about his portrayal of mental illness and emboldening of incels. Joker is a well acted, mature, and emotional movie. 8.25 out of 10. Whoa! Wow. But, you know, I was... How do I say this in there? Just movies parlance. Enhanced. Uh, <laughs> That'll so, do it. I think there's some brilliant moments in this. Like they Just these little, like, visual cues that kind of come back later. Yeah. Uh, but they're not quite as brilliant as this segue to our sponsor. Mm -hmm. Secret Lab, thanks for sponsoring this video and this podcast consistently. You know, Secret Lab, you've been great. And your chairs are, too. They keep you comfortable for those long nights of work and play. Their Titan Evo 2022 Series Chair offers four-way lumbar support, comes with a magnetic memory uh, head pillow that's foam, and is offered in different upholsteries like hybrid leatherette, soft weave fabric, and Nappa leather, the best leather for making a purple tuck Tuxedo. Best of all, a five-year extended warranty is included with... I'm off. can't even do this. Too emotional. I can't do it, guys. A 49-day <laughs> return policy. You're covered if anything goes wrong, so learn more about Secret Lab at lmg.gg slash secretlabtjm. It's in the game. <laughs> and thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring today's episode and the show over the long term. They've been a great sponsor. Their Lawnmower 4.0 is designed to keep your family jewels safe with their ceramic blades featuring skin-safe tech. It's a razor for your crotch, people, in case you didn't know. It reduces nicks and cuts because it's so damn safe. Leave the cables at home because it's so damn wireless and has a new charging system that's compatible with most Qi charging pads. It's cordless. It's waterproof. It gets 90 minutes of use on a full charge. Head to manscaped.com slash TJM20 and get 20% off and free shipping today. Do it one more time. Don't make it 26. What? TJM. It's in the game. It's in the game. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about the synopsis? Hey, I'll give it to you. Thank you. In 1981, professional clown and aspiring comedian Arthur Fleck lives with his mother, Penny, in crime-ridden Gotham City. Through social services, he's able to get medication for his neurological conditions, one of which causes him to laugh compulsively. 
After being assaulted by teenagers, Arthur's co-worker Randall gives Arthur a revolver for self-defense, and Arthur forms a romantic relationship with his neighbor, Sophie. But after accidentally revealing the gun at a gig, Arthur loses his job, and on the subway home, he is beaten by three Wayne Enterprises employees. In desperation, he shoots and kills two of them in self-defense and murders the third when he tries to flee. Billionaire Mayor... Billionaire mayoral Billy can- Mays here. Billy- <laughs> <laughs> Billionaire mayoral candidate Thomas Wayne condemns the killings in a political speech, also referring to his political opponents as clowns, inspiring people to don clown masks to protest the city's funding cuts, which also cause Arthur to lose access to his medication. He performs at the comedy club, which Sophie attends, and he laughs uncontrollably while he bombs. Arthur finds a letter from Penny to Thomas Wayne, claiming that Arthur is his son, so he goes to Wayne Manor and meets a young Bruce before being chased off by Alfred. Talk it's such sh- a depressive little Bruce. I, it, yeah. Talk show host Murray Franklin shows clips of Arthur's failed stand-up and refers to the, expi- to the aspiring comic as a joker. Arthur confronts Thomas, then... The, this is a little disconnected. Then Arthur confronts Thomas Wayne at a theater who then tells him that not only is he not his father, Penny is not his biological mother. Arthur confirms this by stealing Penny's file from Arkham State Hospital, which states she adopted him and raised him with an abusive boyfriend, being admitted to Arkham for allowing the man to abuse her son. Arthur seeks comfort from Sophie in her apartment, only for her to become frightened and demand for him to leave, revealing that the relationship was simply a fantasy in his head. Arthur kills his mother in the hospital the next day. Due to the popularity of his stand-up clips, Arthur is invited onto Murray Franklin's show, where he plans to kill himself on live TV. Gary and Randall, his ex-co-workers, visit Arthur, but Arthur kills Randall and spares Gary since he was always nice to him. Arthur goes on to Murray's show asking to be introduced as Joker since that's what Murray called him. He makes morbid jokes, admits to the subway killings, talks about society, and finally shoots and kills Murray. Riots erupt in the city as Arthur is arrested. One of the rioters kills the Waynes, sounds Bruce, and Arthur is freed by others. The movie cuts abruptly to Arthur in Arkham laughing to himself, telling his therapist she wouldn't get the joke. Finally, he tries to escape as orderlies chase him. I like the ending shot. Yeah. Wait, is that the song? I, I, had, no. a, I had a hard time remembering some of the like actual songs that are used because some of them work really well and, and others don't. don't. Dun, 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 yeah, I hate that. Dun, dun, dun. It's like, is my hockey game? Yeah, I know. Oh, I think that works. Oh, really? I like that. I think I think like they could have chosen a different song with like a similar vibe where mm. it's like, because that's kind of him coming into the Joker identity, sort of. Mm-hmm. But it like it felt too like... I don't know, casual. It felt like... Well, it's like one of those songs that's overused. It's like it's when overused. two characters like fall in love and it's the... Yeah. It's, it's just like, like oh. one of those things that y- people put in YouTube videos because everyone's yeah. heard the song. Do better, Todd Miller. Yeah. My um, Sharona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about what the movie does well. I just, I don't, I just want to reimagine that stair scene with different songs. <laughs> My <now>. Sharona. <laughs> He's like splashing stuff around, doing his cool Joaquin Phoenix dances that he does. Set fire to the rain. You're a good dancer. Thanks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny, Arthur. I was Joaquin's Joker for Halloween that year, and I was dancing and throwing cigarettes all night. Oh my gosh! I mean, it there's definitely. There's a picture on my Instagram. It's one of the last things I uploaded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a certain point when you just stop uploading to Instagram. I think let's talk about the greatest strength of the movie, which is Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix. Himself. Yes, yeah. without yes. a doubt, the best part of this movie. I wouldn't say that he carried the movie, but he definitely took it to the next level. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think uh, there are people who complain that this movie, like. Is, is poorly written, which I don't really agree with, but um, I think that more people would agree with that take or see it that way if it was a lesser actor in the role. Yeah. He definitely took this to the next level, for sure. I wouldn't say that the movie is poorly written. I think the issues that I have with the movie are less on like a technical execution side and more on like the the early pre-production ideation side. We're not talking like, about that right now, though. We're talking about the good stuff. Sure. Joaquin. So to, to bring it back, it, the writing is good. The the performance is good. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I will say that coming into it, I didn't think that he could pull it off because my idea of the what Joker... What can he not pull off? The idea of the Joker in my mind is more of like a Mark Hamill, like Heath Ledger kind of like, you kind of got a squeaky voice. And <laughs> like, and he comes in here and it's like, Joaquin Phoenix's voice is really soft or he sounds like someone who got beat up in high school. That's not... That's, that's your not, George Lucas that's voice. That's not a jo- Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix impression. I can't do a Joaquin Phoenix impression. But you know what I'm saying? His voice is more soft. He's kind of more mm-hmm. of a soft-spoken person. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I didn't think you could pull it off, but then I watched the movie and I'm like, dang, I well, believe you're this person. I think the movie was smart to step away from the traditional Joker tropes and make it just entirely its own Joker. And I think it would, if we were constantly comparing him to like Heath Ledger or, you know, Mark Hamill's Joker, it would be harder. But this is like, I kind of forget that this isn't even in the Batman universe. Yeah. It's just this mentally ill person Although slowly I, being unwound. I do kind of believe that he could become those Jokers. Because mm. you you see glimpses of him in his essence, mm. you know he does that kind of like power dance after he kills, kills people, people and yeah. <laughs> you know or doesn't feel like a victim <laughs> and the killing dance how emboldened he gets towards the end of the movie you yeah. can almost see that he could grow into those other characters. I mean, although I don't believe that in terms of like criminal mastermind, yeah, no. or like chemical engineer who makes these like acid. Uh, toys, yeah, and we're genius. gonna we're gonna get into that, but that remains my biggest problem with the movie is that he's not he's not a genius, he's not funny, he's kind of just a regular depressed guy. Yeah, he's more like somebody who got inspired by the Joker and thinks that he can be this guy. See, I think he's kind of funny when he goes morbid, like that joke, like knock knock, like who's there? The police. Uh, Mark died in a car accident. <laughs> like that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, like the like the Joker way. Right, and there are moments so he gets, of that. He gets there. There are moments of that, and we'll 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 get into that. Yeah, but maybe th- let's talk about some of the other characters too. Like, are there other characters that we thought did, had really good performances? I thought that the is it Gary who he spares? Yeah, when the other guy dies, I thought he really took that scene. He carries the movie. He did that scene. <laughs> like, because Joaquin in that scene, he, he commits this atrocity of murdering this guy brutally in front of Gary. And then he's kind of just on the side of the frame and just kind of sits there and recovers after that. But mm-hmm. it's it's Gary who adds, like, you can hear him wailing. Yeah. And, why? Yeah, why? And, he's, like, and just he's just making these gr- m- noises, just reacting to what he's just seen. And it, it really really moved me i thought he did great he's in the movie for like you know two, two minutes scenes, yeah. but uh in the scenes that he's in he's great well yeah. i agree i think we're so desensitized as an audience you need a character in the movie to react to feel anything and i think that it's effective when he's like cowering in the corner and he's like kind of like crawling his way out yeah, yeah it's like such a sad moment when he can't reach the the <laughs> lock and it's like it's gruesomely <laughs> funny that arthur has to let him out and like he's yeah. still gonna like he's finally feeling power like he won't open the door and just like let him out you know he'll just like open it a bit and he's still playing yeah. with him that it's, scene does so much. Okay. Yeah. So on the one hand, you like you're saying, we needed this other person there. Um, but if it was just another uh, able-bodied, normative kind of person, it, you'd be like, why are they still there? Like Arthur would then need to have like some kind of gun or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But so having him be a little person totally makes sense uh, and like achieves that. So you can have this witness who is, who is kind of powerless next to Arthur, who's not really a physical presence. Yeah. And then, yeah, he can't get out of the door. Uh, which is like uh, simultaneously like terrifying mm-hmm. and kind of comical. Yeah. And, like, well, and then he has to, but then, it, then we get to the other purpose of the scene. Like we get to learn Joker's ethos right. and his moral, understand his moral landscape where he's, he goes, no, you're nice to me. I don't just like kill people randomly. Yeah. I kill dickheads. Well, right. I think it's power too. I think he, he's finally reclaiming his power by fighting, you know, the, the people that have oppressed him. Yeah. And he never feels, yeah, like Gary has, has, he, he can recognize that Gary has no power in this situation, so there's nothing to gain yeah. from killing him. Not only, yeah, but also that he's nice. There's, this, this works well into talking about like the good stuff in the movie because this is my favorite scene in the movie because this is the only one in the movie where he really feels like the Joker mm-hmm. because it is... We're we're witnessing something th- something morbid and grotesque, but it's also really funny. I laughed in this scene mm. because... Uh, You're like sick. The original. Well, listen. I've seen the movie before, so I knew it was coming. So I wasn't as shocked as I was the first time. The first time I was like, "Oh God!" But then this time, now I'm like j- digesting it. The second time, I'm like, "Okay." Th- I appreciate the comedy, but like that's what Joker is. Joker is, and this is why we'll, we'll get into this later. But the Joker is funny. Joker mm. is a funny person, and he's smart. But the reason why everyone hates him and the reason why he's evil is because his comedy is nihilistic it's horrible like there's no moral values put onto his comedy it would be like you know dave Chappelle or whatever <laughs> these more modern comedians who think that like you know society has gotten too woke so they're like pushing the line and getting edgy and stuff but it would be like that times a thousand mm-hmm. like he's like i'm gonna tell jokes that are funny but they're going to offend not just some people but everybody because I'm talking about murdering an orphan mm-hmm. or something you know well I think there's a dynamic in the movie that works for this movie 
uh, but doesn't work for the Joker character, and that's the, his patheticness. Like the Joker, I've yes. never looked at him and been like that guy's pathetic. Exactly, he's got all this power and this intelligence and all this stuff. Whereas Arthur Fleck is a pathetic character, and I think that's how Todd Miller wanted you to empathize or sympathize with him, and yeah. you connect with you know his plight up until you know he goes too far. But even then, they're doing the little things to kind of still humanize him more than I think like a pure Joker would right, be. Right, right. So yeah. anyways, I think we should get more into that after we go more on the positives. Mm-hmm. One one thing that I wanted to bring up that the movie does super, super well is having Arthur do something that he thinks is funny and you believe him that he's just trying to be funny. Like mm-hmm. he's just trying to make people laugh and you believe him, but it comes off as creepy. Yeah. And the, one, a great example of that that I'm thinking of is when he goes and visits Wayne Manor and to to visit oh, Bruce, yeah. he's like he sees Bruce over in the in the yard, and he's like you see his head from the other t- uh, over top of the fence, and he like does the stare thing, walking down, yeah. and then he comes up, or no, he doesn't do the stare thing. He just drops down and then comes back up, and he's wearing a clown nose, and he's walking around being like mm-hmm, doing silly voice, silly faces, and I believe him that like he you're thinks. not malicious right now. You just think this is your brother. Yeah, like you're just trying to have a moment, and you're trying to make people laugh. But it comes off as creepy. Yeah. And I think the movie is trying to do that and it executes very well. When I think that that's another element of Joaquin totally elevating what could be a cheesy movie. Because even his laugh to sob to sob to laugh, a worse actor, you know, you would cringe or you'd be like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, yeah. But, but he your just, heart just falls. When yeah. You see it. I think, uh, I think many things. Uh, what you're talking about where he's, he is, he's good with kids and he's being funny, but yeah the movie is you know there's creepy music playing yeah. so it's like it's simultaneously creepy and you can't can't predict what he's gonna do right. so but you also have this just complex the, feeling the whole movie yeah. and it's also just the framing and the the, the way it's mm-hmm. like portrayed too because it's like him dropping down like that and then coming up with a nose is that you could make that a little less creepy if you do it like a bit more suddenly or something if mm-hmm. you just kind of like if you're like hmm drop down and you would come up and you're like Bleh! You know, do it's like a silly face and you come up and it's like a little bit of a bounce and then you kind of that like telegraphs to the viewer that like, oh, this is funny, but he doesn't. He goes slowly down and then pops slowly back up with a nose on this time. Mm-hmm. And you're like, uh, uh. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the shot is far away. So you don't like it's it's like you're seeing like a stranger being creepy from a distance, you yeah. know, and that's more creepy than like having someone do that right in front of you. I don't know. Well, yeah, the other time he does it is early on in the movie on the bus and he's making the faces at the kid and it's like, it's always just borderline weird. Like it's fine until he starts like, you know, slapping himself and you're like, mm-hmm. huh. Mm-hmm. but then the movie and the, per- the perspective of the world on Arthur Fleck is very, made very clear that like, stop bothering my kid, like stop being a weirdo. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that goes to show Throughout the whole movie. It's just like more, it's like misunderstanding after misunderstanding mm-hmm. of like, I wasn't like, I'm, I'm playing with the kid yeah. he's being fine in that bus scene and yeah. like why why are you treating me this way i feel like to me that's where some of the movie falls apart is that it doesn't give good reasons for the world to beat him up it just knows that he has to be downtrodden and so they come up with these like bigger than life scenarios like i think the scene where the kids steal a sign and beat the shit out of him is really stupid <laughs> like it's like why why are they doing that and like maybe you know it's a superhero movie it's gotham it's the 70s like new york in the 70s yeah, was yeah. A hell, i think it's that but it feels <clears throat> so big it think it, it feels over the top yeah it feels like a like a student film yeah. short type of and thing and like the line that they say i don't even know if it's like spoken in the movie or if it's adr but it's like beat his ass up this yeah. guy's weak he can't do nothing yeah take his stuff come on <laughs> yeah and it's just like huh <laughs> it's like, do kids that's kind of the shit you only notice you have the subtitles on though I didn't have the subtitles on. I was, oh. uh, I had headphones on so I could hear everything. Okay. I could yeah. hear it all around me. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, it does telegraph to you very early on that, like, this city sucks. Mm-hmm. And it's not great for a person with mental illness. Yeah, and I like how that's how it starts. Like, the movie starts, it's not like he's a normal guy and then he descends, like, a bunch of bad things happen to him. He starts in act one, the world as it is today is him getting beat up. He yeah. starts off at that baseline. Uh, and then so his his arc is kind of the transition into power. Mm-hmm. We see that kind of uh, glimpses of his essence when he feels powerful. And I think that that's awesome scene we were talking about where he um, doesn't kill Gary is is so is probably like the midpoint of him really embracing his, his transition to being the Joker and being powerful. And you can see it visually with the makeup because mm-hmm. he's got he's just got white. part of the makeup. He's got just the white on, yeah. which is 
halfway there and it's also makes it creepier because when you've got just the white makeup on it obscures a lot of it's like a mask you can't see all the emotion because mm-hmm. you can't see the eyebrows yeah. or lips as well so it makes him creepier and scarier so that was such an awesome I choice love, to do i that. love that too and even the way they, they ask him like oh like are you going to the rally he's like what <laughs> like i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> yeah and it's yeah. like it's just so it's great <laughs> yeah the whole movie has this dance it has to do where you you ultimately like the joker Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a villain, but you like him. He's a character you like. You might have a figurine of him somewhere. You want to watch <laughs> movies that have him in it. Yeah. But also, uh, it's a movie, so you need to like the main character. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of things that endear us to him, him being an underdog and, and being mistreated. We're on his side. But you also have to kind of hate him. Yeah. He, he ha- he's deplorable. So you have to kind of oscillate back yeah. and forth. And well, I think the movie did a good good job if it's like I sympathize with him. Now he's doing these awful acts. I, I'm kind of disowning him for that. But, uh, but then he's the Joker it. I like and he's cool in the back of the car. Yeah, you, you kind of get it. He, he's not quite as, you know, uh, sympathetic as other villains. But I think he they do a good job making you understand how he got there. Yeah. I mean... I have big problems. I have big let's, problems. Let's let's but, get there later. But um, one more. I, I have another thing I wanted to say about like how, especially on the second th- time through, I have a I have a much greater appreciation for the progression in the movie. I mean, mm-hmm. like you're talking about like how he becomes this like this evil person, and you, we've gone through this journey with him where we empathize with him. But now we see at the end he's in a he's in a dark place, and we can't really empathize with him at that point any anymore. So I re- I had a much greater appreciation for that progression here because I. It's it's clearer to identify that everything changes once he kills the finance bros mm-hmm. on the subway. That's like up until that point, he's not even I think he says to the to the social worker at some point, he's like, I don't even know if I exist or something. Yeah, I don't even yeah, know yeah. if I'm now real. I know I Yeah. And once he kills the finance bros, he sees that he can directly affect the world and he can fight back against these people who are making him feel shitty. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he discovers that he does exist. He can make that. a the mark whole movie, on the world. He's like do I feel seen? Yes. It's kind of like the yeah. biggest recognition. thing for him. His whole, his whole journey in this is recognition. And then he gets that on mass from this like Occupy Wall Street esque yeah. movement, which mm-hmm. is so cool because he didn't, it's not something he tried to do. It just happened. Yes. Based on his actions. Like he was like a pure, uh, like, I don't know, influencer. To use <laughs> he's a, he's a pure force. I mean, like, and that's what the Joker exists to be, right? Well, we talked about it when we did, when we talked about uh, Dark Knight, well, how Heath Ledger's Joker like more than any other joker i think in in the mo- in the movies maybe i don't know i maybe not the older ones but he 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 embodies chaos he is like a force of chaos he's loki you know and uh and that like that that movement that he inspires i think there's a scene um where he's waiting to go onto the show onto, onto the murray franklin show and he's watching the tv and he's watching all these people like protesting and stuff wearing the clown masks and he's laughing but he's got tears in his eyes. So he's like, he's embraced this chaos and nihilism. And he's, he know he also knows he's about to go and try and kill himself at that point. That's his plan think, anyways. Yeah. And so he's got tears in his eyes, but he's laughing because he's like, it's beautiful. This, this, it's this beautiful chaos, beautiful tragedy. Uh, and I thought that was really well done. I was like, yeah. I, I, I got into his mind at that moment. Do you and think I, though that in his mind at that time, he is, when you say it's beautiful, I felt like it's more narcissistic and selfish. It's like, he's happy to have gotten recognition and less like the Nolan Joker who would be happy to see the world be chaos. Well, yeah, no, no, you're right. Is that it's a lot more centered on him. He, mm-hmm. he doesn't care so he cares much more about validation. Yeah. He doesn't care so much that like the, the world is, is doing something or people are doing something out in the world. He's, he's only happy because he caused this thing to happen. Yeah. Although that makes me want to talk about the ending because do you guys agree that, um, when it is revealed that he's in this he's in this um asylum and he says i was thinking of a joke that the whole movie is is that joke he's thinking of it hasn't actually happened i don't think so i don't think the movie gives enough clues that it's like you know this uh the only the strong clue <laughs> is that the social the guards counselor whoever he's talking to is the same woman same no. act. is it not the same actor it's not it's not the same actor no it's a different person which i thought was interesting because i'm like he he had black women uh therapists for both of the situations interesting man last night i was like is that but I'm, I'm like do they, they don't all look alike but i would read but, that yeah yeah no but, like i felt like but are I you would serious read, that's a different actor I, I know for sure it's a different actor but i oh would I, I would theory. say that that's maybe a 
a clue that it was all in his head. Because the first time around we talked about this, uh, how, you know, the Sophie relationship was in his head. Uh, and then, like, at the end of the, at the climax, he's on top of the cop car and everyone's praising him and saying, yeah, good job, blah, blah, blah. And then somehow from that point, he gets, he gets put in Arkham. So it's like, okay, I guess they caught him. And there's like a bit of a leap there. So mm. there's there's room for interpretation to say that uh, maybe maybe the whole story, maybe the whole movie is in his head and he's just in Arkham the whole time. I hope not. I, I, I don't want... I, I hope they I'm don't saying, I'm that. saying that's not like 100% what it is, but there's room for interpretation. Yeah. It's, it's I know ambi- a lot of people do interpret it that way, especially when he's running around with this handcuffs off and stuff at the yeah. end. Um, I and I was with you. Where it's ambiguous. I thought that was gross. No, but I actually kind of like it on this oh. watch. Wait, what's gross? If they it, did, it, if it yeah. is all in his head, like yeah. A retelling. I like it just being straightforward. Like uh, like th- he was on the dancing on the car and he gets arrested and then he goes yeah. to the prison. I don't like. I, I didn't like the idea that the whole time he was just like this was happening in his head and he goes ha 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 and then his, his uh, counselor goes what oh that two hour uh, thought I just had. You wouldn't get it. If I had to bet which one is like the t- true ending, it's that it's not all in his head. Is that mm-hmm. it, it all happened and then he got institutionalized at some point? But but it's interesting though because like for a couple of reasons. Number one, the thing that's funny, I think, um, that the when he says you wouldn't get it if yeah. it's all in his head, that that fantasy he just played out in his head is that he created Batman. And the reason I think that is because Batman. Yeah, because he basically, through his actions, this riot ensues. Oh. And it's one of those rioters who kills the Waynes, right. creating Batman. And not only does that happen, you know, 20 minutes before the end of the movie, but it's shown again immediately before mm. we go out of his head into the asylum. It's shown again? They, yeah, they show Bruce Wayne again, like right before oh, it goes to him like laughing. Oh, Oh, okay. And so it's like, I think that it could be him going, huh, I just thought it was this funny joke. Like, what if oh, this timeline existed where I created Batman yeah. from doing these things? I like that. I See, think that's kind of cool. That's why I like the ambiguity of the ending because, yeah. I mean, and almost always, unless, like, there are some movies that just trigger people because it's like... This is a stupid, ambiguous ending. Like, one of them is clearly better. But I feel like in this one, you know, I like that it's open open to interpretation because of the reasons you said. And also, for me, it was like a little bit of an out uh, the in terms of the possibility that he isn't actually the Joker. <laughs> is that he's like just some guy in a, in a prison having this dream about the Joker. I think as long as they don't retcon uh, having a definitive, ans- definitive answer in the sequel... Uh, I'll be well, fine. I think that the fact that okay. there is a sequel yeah. means that they'll he, have to be. A he's the Joker. Answer. That it was real. Well, yeah. it's definitely that he's the Joker. It's just I guess the question for me, the way I look at it is like, is that his, is that a real turn of events? Because I think it's in the Killing Joke or whatever. He's got that line that says, "If I'm gonna have a past, it might as well be multiple choice." Yeah. So it's always been kind of mm. we don't really know okay. his origin. So yeah, that's interesting. It's like this is one imagined origin, and he thinks it'd be funny. Yeah. If, so yeah. like, in case the viewers aren't aware, a sequel has been. Green lid, it's in production. Yeah, uh, and what's it called again? Foley Adu, Joker Foley Adu, and it's like a yeah. reference to something. Uh, yeah, it's a reference to this like psychological phenomenon where uh, shared psychosis or shared delusional disorder. Right, and so this movie has Harley Quinn, who is his his therapist. Right. So I guess he'll be in this, they and, and apparently it takes place like all in this asylum. I think. Oh. So. Oh really? He, so my guess is that she'll be his therapist, and he'll kind of like convey these. Yeah, psychotic uh, ideas to her. Right, it's and, a collection of, and rare... it's like a musical somehow. So I think and those will probably happen in in their psyches. Like they'll have like the shared fantasies of these extravagant yeah. and that, that musical numbers. The the definition has delusional beliefs or sometimes hallucinations transmitted from one individual to another. So yeah, that, yeah. That, as that, long as there's no Batman, that might be my least favorite stuff in this movie. Is the Thomas Wayne? Like they integrate it well into the plot, but like when it's like, hello. Bruce, it's like yeah, uh, that was super on the nose. I remember in the theater being like, Ugh, yeah. when that, that happened. That, but that on this watch, does, I didn't care. That scene does stand out from the rest of the movie. I think it it feels like a, a scene that they inserted for member berries. Uh, I think it just would have been way classier if they just never said the word Bruce. Yeah, like yes. we all know 
That's that Thomas kid, Wayne's yeah. kid. That's got to be Bruce. Just don't say it. Yeah, that's time. true. It would be so much better if we were just like, oh, Thomas Wayne's kid. Yeah. Yeah. I think the movie does show great restraint most of the time. It just, it's almost like it more painful when it doesn't because you're like, you were so close. Yeah. I think the movie really succeeds on a visual level. Uh, sh- like the visual symmetry between like the kids beating him up versus the finance guys beating him up and then he finally has power he can fight back but the big one that struck me on this rewatch was the opening scene I think it's such a great scene like you kind of get the state of the world through the radio and he's frowning and then he he like forces a smile but he can't but he takes his fingers and he like forces yeah. a smile then down and it's like this visual for you know he has to force what feel like there's like an outside force coming in to force him what to feel like the mm-hmm. outside world and then later they kind of match it with the final scene where he's got this bloody mouth and he like gently gives himself a smile. Like it's like he's kind of found the the smile from within. And I think it, right. when you match those two shots, it's actually kind of brilliant. Really See, like I, what I wrote down is, so that's like the first shot in the movie mm-hmm. basically. And I agree with you, but what I wrote down is that w- one of the things that makes this movie hard to digest is whether it thinks it's a serious movie or a comic book movie and like obviously it's in the middle it's a serious comic book movie but i think that sometimes it like really wants to be like a serious serious movie Mm -hmm. and and that makes it jarring when these like comic book things come in not even like comic book but like like the the other elements of comic book movies where um you just feel like slightly less art was put into it Mm -hmm. and uh the thing i'm thinking about there is some of the technical execution uh i already said that the technical execution in in most of the movie is really really good but in Mm -hmm. the first scene where he's talking so right after that i think he talks to the therapist and um the social worker yeah the social worker and he's and he's doing this compulsive laughter thing and like that's a really really interesting idea we made up this neurological condition that makes you laugh i think that fits the character really well it does Mm -hmm. it does but in that scene I could tell it's a lot of it is ADR. Mm. And so, and I will say every scene after that is, it's better. I like, didn't notice. I yeah. Didn't notice every anything. scene after that, uh, I think they, I think they might've used ADR one more time for the compulsive laughter, but and this one, it's very obvious to me. And I was like, okay, this is taking me out of it right away. And it seems kind of goofy. And then it goes to the social worker and she is like, I mean, I didn't like her. I didn't like that actor. I feel like she just like brought no character to it at all. Mm. And I know she's supposed to be like uncaring and like just a front for the system or whatever, but you can still bring in some like character moments with that. Mm. Like you can be more like the friggin' uh, well, Jamie Lee Curtis and everything everywhere all at once where mm. like you are kind of hateable as, well, a, as a person, but she was just kind of like, I am an actor and they offered me this side. I feel like these are nitpicks. This, this minor, it is, but no. What I'm saying is that that feeds into my 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 uh, conflict over whether to view this thing yeah. as a serious serious movie or like a comic book movie that's more on the serious well, I side. I think the movie can't decide if it wants characters or characters with a capital C, and I think that she's a character mm. with the lowercase C, right, and right. it doesn't fit when she's played against someone who's so huge. Yeah. And you kind of miss, you know, her internal acting. Right. And, like, I feel like most of the movie is just a <laughs> mismatch of, like, huge characters and kind of just, like, you know, underplayed. And I, yeah. I, I don't know if it really works. And I, I totally agree. The movie would be better suited. It, this movie would be amazing if it wasn't a Joker movie. <laughs> like, or if it was, like, not exactly. a Batman movie. Yeah. Uh, I think that's honestly, like, that's why I said in my slogan, I'm like, it's not a jo- it's not a movie about the Joker, mm-hmm. but once you kind of if you let go of the need to map your idea of Joker onto it, it is a good movie. Oh, yeah, I think it's very good. But now I think it's time to talk about that to talk about why this guy is not the Joker in my mind. I mean, we kind of already talked about it, but like Give it to, me. to me, the the main problem is that Joker is supposed to be evil. He's not supposed to be a sympathetic character, and you can you can you can read an origin story of the Joker and say, oh man, that's horrible that this happened to him. But at the core, you have to understand that Joker as a, as a individual is an evil person on the level of like Hitler. Mm -hmm. And he was just, he was just waiting for some set of circumstances to transform him into this, this larger than life, like almost cosmic force of evil and chaos. And so it's like, 
you can't we can't think that we can't think that oh if the joker just had a friend yeah if the or, system hasn't had yeah failed or him, if the joker just still had like the social services he was on then his he wouldn't be the joker yeah. yeah we'd have to we have to understand that the Joker was probably going to become the Joker regardless. Mm-hmm. Are you, would you go so far, far as to say if he wasn't so crazily abused as a toddler? No, I feel like the Joker should... St- like we he should comes st- out the womb as the Joker? Like we we should feel as if uh, it would be more work if you were if you were setting up the Joker's life like Truman Show style. If you could like place everything perfectly where you wanted it, it would be more work, way more work to make the Joker not become the Joker than it would be to have the Joker become the Joker. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. So like in this one, it feels like not enough things happen to or sorry, it, it feels like uh I, too I many lost events, my, like too many events happen that yeah, ha- happen to too, make him. Yeah, not not enough. Too many things happen, so that it's w- super understandable how a human being would would end up this way. Totally, you especially know? the first killing. You're like, yeah, duh. Like, right, exactly. They're gonna kick the shit out of him. He's allowed to defend himself. Exactly. Well, that's the, that stuff just puts him over the edge, though, because he's already like every scene with his mom reveals how abusive she is. Yeah. Like, what makes you think but you can like, do that? You're okay, not funny. But like, it's she, like everything. So it's like, okay, he's got mental illness maybe because of the abuse or whatever but like he was abused as a, as a child he was gaslit by his mom he got his social services cut he gets beat up by people in the street he uh loses his job he gets beat up by people in the subway well everyone also just treats him like a weirdo everyone treats him like a weirdo it's just like weirdo. boom 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 all of these things he gets made he tries to do a comedy he gets made fun of on national tv mm-hmm. that like was could make anyone lo- mm-hmm. like snap uh so it's like there's so many things and so that by the end of the movie, I'm like, yeah, yeah. honestly, I just feel bad for him. And you shouldn't feel bad for the Joker. You should hate the Joker. I think, though, that like that's a concession you have to make for an origin movie, because if it was this movie about this absolutely horrid person who like was always going to be the Joker, that doesn't make a great arc yeah, or a great movie. Saying, well, right? and this is why they I thought it was weird that they were making a Joker movie at all. I'm like, why would you? But what? I mean, like, that's the kind of thing that comes from the top down. Like, that's not, yes. I don't think Todd Phillips woke up one night and was like, I need to tell the Joker story. It's right. like some executives like, what's our profitable characters? Everyone loves the Joker. Let's do like right. uh, art. Not necessarily. He, they he, wanted, it, but, he yeah. wanted to do an independent character study movie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so he guess, had previously turned down superhero movies. Mm. So, uh, and Joaquin also wanted to be the Joker. That was like, or no, what did he, like independently, like two years before this script was written, Joaquin was like, oh, I remember maybe I something could do that. about that. Yeah. So I guess my uh, a broader complaint that I have is the fact that they made the movie at all because of these issues. Like, if you're going to make the movie, it has to be like a really, really dark, it has to be like a Hitler biopic. Because we can't, we can't like watch a movie about Hitler and just feel bad that all oh, these bad things happened to Hitler. Oh, he got kicked out of art school. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> a, a movie documenting Hitler's rise has to pay a lot of attention to the fact that he, like, a lot of his fucked up stuff comes from internal uh, things that he yeah. has. You, so you feel like the movie doesn't succeed at showing that there's evil within him at the beginning. Yes. I, I we, kind we, of agree. We like in the beginning I just want him to be happy. I just want him to have a nice yeah, life. He's such a he seems, beat up character. He seems sweet. His mom always calls him like, Oh, you've always been such a happy boy. And even though when she says that, you're kind of like, Is that true though? But like and, and later it, it yeah. But uh, He stalks his neighbor. But that's like a couple bit of uh, least forty minutes. He does in stalk Hollywood. his neighbor, but but at like I, that's just kind of like misguided, you know. Like he doesn't know how to. Just standing at the edge of a playground with a hood on in the rain. Exactly. I, d- d- yeah, it's creepy, but I just feel like it's because he wants human connection. That's what, the, what he's missing. That doesn't feel like the Joker. It just feels like a, a misguided weirdo. Yeah. Like you know, he's 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 got like a lower mental age. That's the other thing. Yeah. Okay. There's the evil aspect, and then the other aspect is competence yeah. and 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 intelligence. The Joker is extremely intelligent he's like a genius level intellect on the on the level of batman and he's funny he has to be funny like i said before he hate it's like he should be his his failure as a comedian shouldn't be because he's not funny his failure as a comedian should be because it's he is dark. funny but the jokes are just way too dark and like why are you even joking about that? that's horrible but i think i think that my problem isn't with him being funny or not because i think as soon as he gives into the darkness he does become funny in the way that the joker is I think that the failing is just like it's just he's a he's a product of the world and like I don't think 
I mean, maybe the Joker is kind of like a product of the world because he even the Joker admits he's like I only exist because you exist Batman like I can only be who I am because of you right and so maybe there is more of an element to you know culture shaping Joker than we're giving credit to see and that's why it feels weird to make a Joker movie without Batman mm-hmm. because and I I don't I don't necessarily I know that in some in some comics and media Joker has said something to that effect where he's like I only exist because of you Batman if you didn't exist then I wouldn't exist mm-hmm. but like I don't think that's fair like I think that once you have the Joker and Batman figures on the board then yes they work really well together and they're foils of each other and blah 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 but I think that you can tell a story just about the Joker it would just have to be it would just have to be more about it would it would have to be less about him reacting to the world and more about him being this Hitler, this like force of evil that embraces nihilism and chaos. I think the the movie becomes so repulsive. I think like you can't. I know, but that's the it, only it, movie. Sorry, good. I just think you can't like make a movie that people would want to engage with, and I think that's always part of the calculus. Is you need you don't need a likable protagonist, but you need someone that is your avenue into emotionally connecting with exactly. the movie. And Arthur Fleck is that. And maybe it'd be better if. You know the the it was the movie about Gary and he just watches yeah. the downfall of Joker. Or I don't something. know. I, I don't know. I, maybe this is how I know that I'm like pushing too hard at this point because mm-hmm. you know you can come back. Because I'm bored. It. No, you can come. <laughs> James is always bored. You can come back with the like the retort that like okay, but this is the only way they could do it and still make money. It's like okay, fair, but like then don't make the movie. You know, yeah. like the only way that you would do justice to the character is by making a movie that people don't like you know there's a understated line in this movie that i think holds a lot of weight it's when he's first talking to the social worker and she says have you given any more thought about why you were locked up because like it it implies that he was institutionalized before and Mm -hmm. that he's no longer Mm. and he goes who knows (laughs) and i think that is so awesome yeah he's just like i just don't fit in this world with everyone else. Right, right. Is it in that scene that she asks him, she's like, or he says, like, I was happier locked up or whatever? Like, there was yeah. more sense to it? This is why I kind of... Wait, sorry, what scene is this? Early social worker scene, probably the first one. Oh, okay. Got I think it. that I'm coming around to the idea that uh, it all was in his head because you have... They tell you that at the beginning. Was like, why have they established that he was institutionalized before? Like, it has no bearing on the rest of the movie. And then you've got the whole plot with his neighbor where they which basically serves the only purpose it serves is to establish that he's an unreliable narrator Mm -hmm. where it's like you've been seeing things from his perspective and some of that stuff isn't real yeah yeah Uh, so well i think they established it earlier why do a lot of his fantasy stuff uh i think it's just the movie wants to do a big rug pull yeah uh that like stuff that you're seeing in real time isn't real because you you see him like fantasize about murray and stuff and it's very clear that it's fantasy uh and i feel like those fantasy scenes are so hit or miss for me. I think yeah. the, the love subplot sucks. It makes me so, yeah. un- it makes me uncomfortable and like maybe the movie the way it wants, but it brings down my enjoyment of the movie. Like I'm going to fully admit, I, I like would fast forward through those scenes because they just, oh, like, really? I just oh, like they don't add enough to the movie for me. Mm, for the, the ones with the neighbor. Yeah. The ones with the neighbor. I'm just like, this is, they're pretty short. See, I yeah. will say that I'm like, I have to skip much. The, rom- the romance subplot is or the non-romance subplot is a big reason why I actually enjoyed this movie more the second time around mm. because the first time I was like this is horribly written like there's no way that she would be into him or whatever yeah. you know and it just didn't seem believable but the movie wasn't using the language of his delusions like when he, when we have the Murray thing it's pretty obvious that this is a dream a because he oh. just starts out watching the show and then it cuts to him He's in, the, in show, the audience yeah and everything is just going so well and it's like if I had a son it'd be you pal yeah. and then he <laughs> hugs him and like yeah. it's like he's and it's like okay this is 100% a delusion that was great too because then they established that he wants a father figure yes he and just then, wants so to that, be recognized. that yeah. builds on to the Thomas Wayne thing which a lot of I've seen a lot of people on reddit were saying they're like that felt tacked on to them, but I disagree I that it's so. tacked on. I think it's pretty, pretty integrated into the, a lot right, of the other right. things in the movie. When I like and how it, his his love of Murray is a good signal of where he is, like the fact that he's so wanting so, like this love from Murray, and then yeah. by the end he kind of gets it. He gets like noticed and seen, but it just turns, and he's he's so far gone past needing that level of human connection that he, yeah. he kills him. No, I, I I do I really appreciate the whole like Murray as surrogate father uh, uh, subplot. But to go back to the romance thing, um, so the first time around, I was like, this seems stupid. But on the rewatch. This seems poorly written. And on the rewatch, I was like, 
oh, this is way more obvious once the idea's in my head that maybe it's not real. Well, f- I, I was just trying to figure out which of these are not real. Is it like the only scene that is real is when they're on the elevator and she does so. the g- finger guns to her head and yeah. the, everything else that is, is yeah. and a they, fantasy. They leave the elevator and he, he just walks down the hall and then he's like, hey, and she turns around and then he goes like, and it's like a more grotesque it, pretending it's to blow like your brains out. And, and she's kind of like, huh. and then she's like giving him like weird looks. Yeah. But, and that scene is so good because she gives a weird look and like gets inside her apartment quickly, but it cuts back to him and he's like, huh, I made her day. Nailed yeah. it. And it's like, no, <laughs> yeah. that's like what I was talking about earlier where he thinks he's just trying to make people laugh. And the stalking is real after that. The stalking yeah. is real. But her the, going up to his apartment yeah, being like, the first were you time, following me? That is fake. And were I, you following me? And then he's like, well, I, you know, I could bring a gun and like yeah. kill your coworkers I know, or whatever. It's so obvious on the rewatch because after that, he's she's like, Arthur, you're so funny. Yes. And she doesn't know his name. She doesn't know like anything yeah. about him. But it, and it's like, that's the, that's the language of his delusion is yeah. like, Arthur, you're this. Yes. That's the moment where I'm like, oh, okay, this is way more obvious this time around. And then every scene after that, I was like, Oh, of course. Of course it's delusional. She's just like get, paying him compliments, supporting him. Like there's no depiction. And that's also why it felt really weird the first time because I'm like, this doesn't feel like a real relationship. Mm-hmm. But not. I didn't. it didn't enter my into my mind that it could not be real. Yes. I thought the movie was just failing. It yeah. sets up the sequel well because if they didn't have that, then the prospect of romantic love would be a new... A whole new theme in the sequel with Harley Quinn, but at least they've set up that that's something he he wants. wants. Yeah. Also, during his stand-up routine, he gets up there, and we, the audience, are cringing at him. But she's laughing. But as she and she's laughing, and as he kind of like regains his composure and starts to tell his joke, the the music plays in, and we don't hear what he's saying, and we hear the audience clapping, and we're like. Hmm. See, at that point, I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure that this is a delusion type thing. But uh, on a second watch, it's like so much more obvious what's going on. Um, oh, that one more good thing that I wanted to like talk about in a broad sense is the, the I don't know if it's direction or writing or maybe Joaquin was involved with some of this, but like really good character moments after like... Something happens and then Joaquin does something and it just kind of like underlines the whole thing. So like the moment that I'm in particular that I'm thinking of is when he kills his mom with the pillow in the hospital and then it's done and he goes and just like stands by the window and the, and the camera like pans like uh, uh, Dolly's back and he's just like illuminated in the light and he's just like, hmm. And it's like this horrible, horrible thing just happened, but to him, it's a it's, it's angelic, like he's like free. Heavenly, he's yeah. it's, he's at peace, you know. And there are a couple moments like yeah. that throughout the, the movie. The no, most notable one is after he uh, kills those guys on the train, and he takes refuge in that bathroom, right? And he does catches the, his breath, and then he, they spend like a full minute of yeah. him just like slowly dancing, and him. That's just kind of him being his essence for the first time. Yes, uh, feeling not feeling powerless. He's like so it's happy. A, it's a now. visual character growth moment. It's yes, all, that's yeah. awesome. There we go. That's that's a way to to underline what I'm saying. Um. Okay. Oh, and uh, well, I guess maybe we're into hit picks and nit picks. No? Yeah, no, I am. Okay. Nit picks. Thomas Wayne. (laughs) Um, I mean, big hit pick in the end of the psych hospital. He's like the entire movie. He's been laughing compulsively. When he laughs like that, you know that he's upset or uncomfortable or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in the end, in the psych hospital, in the psych hospital, he's laughing. Not because of his condition. He's laughing because something's funny. Mm-hmm. And I love that, that that contrast because he's genuinely laughing and the, and the person's like, can you let me in on the joke? And he's like, you wouldn't get it. And that's the first time that I'm like, I'm almost, it's like you're almost happy for him because yeah. he, now he can like actually laugh in a real way, but it's dark, you know? I love that laughing while crying. It was like the signature of this movie. Yeah. It was like such a good choice and Joaquin does it so well. So well. And it's so... I don't know it's it's it serves so many purposes because it allows him to get into confrontations because people don't understand they think he's laughing but he's really not he's really crying and it, it helps us like feel for him like when he just has like these because who wants to watch a movie where people are having sobbing fits multiple times there's probably five different scenes where he yep. just has these extended laughing fits but right it's more complicated and like we watch it we're weeping while we watch him yeah laughing it's like a sad little that's literal a great sad point clown it's like of. as a alternative uh, to a scene where someone's just crying. It makes it watchable. Awful. It makes it watchable. But I'll watch 45 seconds yeah. of him like laugh crying. Because it's fascinating. In a stairwell. Yeah, it's so great. Um, 
sort of a mid pick, I guess. It's like a hit pick and a nitpick at the same time. The part where he says, "Is this when he kills his mom?" I forget. He's like, "I used to think my life was a tragedy, but now I realize it's a fucking comedy." Does he say that before he kills his mom? Yeah. I believe that's when. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's like a hit pick and a nitpick for me because it like it describes the movie very well, but it's also really, really on the nose. And, you know, that's the kind of... I don't know. It's just like... It's I a just, trailer I moment. I just cringed. I just cringed. It's, like, it's a fucking comedy. Like, I don't know. Did, 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 I hear that you. didn't make you feel anything? I hear you. I could, it could be yeah. kind of be read both ways. My uh, big nitpick is the during the riot scene... I think it's a it's a good little ride or whatever, <laughs> but the amount of people, jeez, get, get out of here! Yeah, stink? Is that a stink here. bug? I don't know. Anyways, the amount of people, the amount of people that run around with like those color grenades is yeah. really <laughs> it's stupid. Because like the first time you see, why it, do so many of you have these? It's like the like almost looks like tear gas, but like no one's affected by it, and then it's just clear it's like for visual impact. But right. it's stupid when you think about it. Yeah, when that first when he's like lying on the car and the first guy like runs across and he's like. Okay, everybody, and yeah. he like and he like ignites it, and you're just like this. This seems like an extra. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really need it because we can just accept that there's like a level of smoke in the ride or whatever, like yeah. whatever. But a bigger nitpick for me is in the late night talk show uh, before he kills Murray. Like the the way that the movie ramps up the vibe is good. Cause it the, like the intensity does ramp up up until he shoots him in the head. And then it's like, it's, it's the, the ramp up is there that you need, but the way that he does it is really annoying to me because mm. his, it's like a moral diatribe about how no one's, no one cares. No one thinks about what the other person's feeling anymore. No one's empathetic. And I'm like, the Joker shouldn't come from a place of like moral superiority. Mm. He's not like I'm the Joker. I turned to being yeah. the Joker because not enough people are good in the world. And it's like that means that he has a moral intuition and he thinks that people should behave morally, but not enough people are doing mm. it. So now I'm the Joker. It doesn't. It just doesn't make any sense. It's completely. Yeah, I, I hear you there. It's completely off the, what the character's motivation. Unless should he was be. gonna say, "So screw it." If you guys want to play that way, let's all embrace chaos. Right. And that's what happens. But I just feel like that completely takes the, like, I talk, I said this earlier. Although he does. The Joker should be like a cosmic, he should be like a larger than life thing. Yeah, pure evil. He shouldn't just be like a guy. Like, you shouldn't be able to knock the, the apple box out from under the Joker and now he's just a dude. Mm -hmm. Well, unless, unless it's like, uh, selfish. You know, just you know, when some people think they want a revolution, so everybody's equal, but really they just want to like shuffle the deck so that different people are powerful. Because mm. it's kind of like that. You know, you would step over people like me in the street. You just walk right over. Well, now people like me are going to be on yeah, top. Yeah, right. That's, and that's what this movie does. Right, and that's wrong because Joker isn't about setting up a new world order. It's pure chaos. Joker is just about fucking everything up. I mean, then the, in, in the Dark Knight, he's he, he, blo he uh, sets the money on fire. He doesn't care about Himself, structures. Yeah. He, he, he wants to tear down everything. So I, I don't know. He doesn't want other people to be in power now. Anyways, I, I, that's what I didn't like. I do want to shout out in that scene, his intro, his little walkout dance and the kiss of the doctor. And oh, yeah. I very much enjoy that. I enjoy when his dances are contained. I think like my favorite dance moment and huge hit pick is when he kills the finance guys and he just does like the one like hand over the head pelvic thrust. Yeah. <laughs> and he like, like, runs away. I fucking love that. Yeah, I yeah. like one scene that I think sums up a lot of the themes in microcosm is when they're watching Thomas Wayne on TV. Cause he's, he obviously doesn't understand the Arthur's plight at all. He basically mm -hmm. says like, yeah, these, these good people who work for my company were slain by some loser who has to hide behind a mask who's I feel cat. like that was so simple I don't know his everything he said in that scene annoyed me it felt like it was that's exactly it though oh yeah because like Arthur's watching that being watching someone that is kind of like an like a hero like Thomas Wayne the way his mom talks about him and he's just like ah he's talking about me Oh, but he doesn't get me at all. That's he's fair. like, it's just the same thing as on the bus when the mom is like, don't interact with my kid. He's like, that's not what happened at all. Yeah. And that's just the whole thing in microcosm in that one scene. It happens to him repeatedly throughout the movie. He's yeah. just misunderstood. Um, uh, nitpick, or no, hit pick, uh, when the detectives come to talk to him at the hospital and they're like, you know, questioning him and he, they're like, okay, one more question. The laughing thing. Is that part of your act? And he's like, 
he takes a drag of his cigarette. He's like, what do you think? And like turns around, <laughs> smacks into the door. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome too because you can see he takes a second to think about it. And he's like, oh, I got a sweet. I'm gonna yeah. Do- I, I got him here. And he yeah. like delivers it coolly, throws the cigarette and then it's like, nope. <laughs> Honestly, I laughed at that part because it was funny. But now I'm like, that is a microcosm for the problems with this movie. Because we're not laughing with him. We're not thinking that he's funny. We're laughing at him. He's a he's a joke. He's a he's a he's a failure. Well, that's because um, he's a- oscillating between his essence and his mm-hmm. you know failed or fractured self. No, I know. I just it's uh, hit, hit pick at the part of the movie where we think it's possible actually that Thomas Wayne is his father and that like like his mom worked there and then got knocked up by this rich guy and the rich guy just paid to like have her sign an NDA and and then banished her so that no one would ever know that he knocked her up. Mm. Uh, I just wrote down the rich literally fucked them. Wait, (laughs) he is his son. No, no, no. That was just a delusion of his mother. Okay. But that's the thing is like, but they obviously dated or something or he like, he must've, he just, she just worked there. Later. He finds a picture of his mom and on the back it says, you're you have such a beautiful smile or something and it says thomas wayne but that's not like that it, that's no, I, that could be the kernel of yeah. her obsession right there's usually like some kind of kernel yeah of truth. but well that's it just like at that point i was like okay she's just fully delusional but then they show this photo and i'm like okay obviously if she was just a housekeeper like obviously there was some sort of thing between them you never know yeah you never, that's that you the thing know. is when you the thing with all conspiracy theories and even religion that to some extent when it's not falsifiable because they they evoke an elite right she she's given the evidence of like here are the fucking adoption papers like yeah, yeah. you adopted this kid yes but then she goes well he's an elite and he had those made up because mm. he's so powerful he can cover up no evidence that can be produced is going to be persuasive it's right. not falsifiable that's when you know you're in the deep end of any kind of yeah, conspiracy I guess so. theory yeah. or any line of thinking i appreciate how the movie like leaves that i mean they they make you like you have enough information to kind of like place your bets you know you have enough information to be like okay it was probably that she's delusional mm. but i like that the movie kind of keeps giving you these things where you're just like but okay. Oh, okay yeah i don't know i actually really like the portrayal of the mom mm. um she seemed like super realistic in her mental yeah. illness and patterns yeah. like i have some experience with that in my life and i was just like <laughs> bingo mm. yes um do you guys feel like i know riley it's a big thing for you that the the movie succeeded in making clear that like the Joker is not to be idolized because I know when this movie came out. Oh wait, big before thing. we get into okay. that, can I just tack on one little yes, extra please, thing about the mom, uh, just so we can totally have an, a nod on that or a bow on that? Is when um, she says to him, "Thomas Wayne owes it to us." Mm. Like she's so entitled, he owes it to us. Yeah, uh, it, that's just congruent with all the other things I just said. Basically, mm-hmm. it's just another point of like that's just her mentality is just so perfect of like people whose minds are like that. Yeah. Anyways, right. <laughs> When this movie um, came out, it came out after like a bunch of riots and stuff. Was it around Black Lives Matter or something? Or I, I can't remember. Or I some don't know incel shootings. I yeah. think yeah, the incel thing was was much more of a concern when this movie. It's 2019, so it was. Tr- I think the Black Lives Matter riots and stuff were 2020. Nope. Yeah, because they were during time. COVID. I think 2019 had protests. But anyways, regardless, around when this this movie came out, uh, the incel. Like, like that guy had like driven a truck into a crowd in Toronto or something. Yeah. Um, so like, I think incel as a term was kind of like entering the mainstream consciousness in a big way around the time when this movie came out or before. And so, yeah, that was one of the questions. It's like, is this adding fuel to the yeah, fire? I remember watching him dance on that car and being like, this is kind of irresponsible. He looks like a hero. People, yeah. people could be mm-hmm. emboldened by this. But on this watch, I didn't feel that as strong. And I wonder if it's just because... That's just not at the forefront mm. of the news cycle this week, or what? You know, it's funny, James. I listened to the first. Uh, I listened to the first time, the first version of this podcast, and you made an argument that the movie has a responsibility to uh, show that the Joker is deplorable and that like his actions should not be emulated. And that's me all the time. That's you now. That's my whole thing. I influenced you. <laughs> I only said that because of you. Yeah, I influenced you. Um, <laughs> I'm your dad. So like, and and I and I agree with you, James, uh, that the movie does have a responsibility, and other movies do as well, to uh, 
to show when you're showing horrible characters that it needs to be obvious that like they're a bad guy. And I think this movie does that. And I think, uh, I think you said that the movie doesn't do it as well in the first one, but I don't know how you feel about that now. Do you um, think the movie does enough of a job to enough work to show that like this character is not somebody to, to be emulated? It's hard to say. I mean, like when, when he's on the talk show and he, uh, slays Murray, it's really like, holy man, you're awful. And everybody's scared and they all leave. And he just sits there like a freak. Like he look, he looks really awful. Yeah. But then he's got the adoration of the crowd. Yes. At the end. But the crowd is like looting and doing fucked up shit. But they're rebelling against a society that's like economically stratified and like the institutions are failing. So they're kind of like, they're just real people. They're not all evil people, right? right. They're, they're like revolting. Uh, so it's really entangled and it's hard to say. One thing that you said that could have improved that vibe uh, uh, specifically was when he's standing on the car and he's like reveling in the adoration of the crowd during that scene specifically, it cuts back to people doing horrible things. Like the, the writers. Oh, right. That's what, yeah. I, what I recommended. I remember I had a very specific recommendation. Yeah, just to have that intercut with people doing atrocities. No. Yeah. So you can see that like he caused this bullshit. He yeah. caused this like awfulness in the world. For, for my part, when I heard that people were kind of like, uh, they were writing articles about how making this movie was dangerous and irresponsible and stuff when it was coming out. And it's like, oh, we can't show, you know, we can't make movies about villains and stuff. And I think this came out after, th- yeah, it came after out after Endgame or Infinity War at the very least. So uh, there was this discussion about Thanos and like it was like a similar thing where they were like, it's irresponsible. Like Thanos says that he loves Gamora and that's not love. And it's like irresponsible of, of the movie, of the, of the movie makers to, to show, to say that this is love. And then it's like actually abuse. And I'm like, I had the same problem with those people saying that as people criticizing this movie, which is that he's the villain. Like when you're watching the movie, seeing the villain do horrible things shouldn't be like, Oh no, uh, people are going to emulate this or people are going to think that this is good. No, that like, that's an right. invalid criticism. You're meant to take for granted that every th- yeah. way that they do anything is yeah. the bad way to do it. And it's obvious that he's the, mil- so like before I saw the movie, I was like, who's going to emulate the Joker? Like he's the Joker. Why would you ever, why would you ever think that something the Joker is doing is something even close to but morally, think, morally, uh, um, I think what justifiable. the, the, the one thing I would put against the movie is that, but I was it wrong. Make, it makes it clear that the only option was violence. And like right. I think that it doesn't necessarily glorify it or glorify what he does, but it shows, hey, you're frustrated, everything around you is crumbling. This is this is the way. Yes. And I think that that's the one thing I would be like the movie could have maybe done it. And it doesn't need to have like, you know, a character who's like, "I want to help you, Arthur." And he's like, "No." Right. But <laughs> right, right. it needs to show that like the choice of violence there was alternatives. Yeah. And I don't think it, th- th- there is. So like, yeah. So I agree with you completely. The, I thought this, these things before watching the movie. And then after watching the movie, I was like, oh, this is why people were concerned mm-hmm. because this is not the Joker. This is just some guy. Anybody could be driven to this. Uh, like the movie is saying, anybody could be driven to this uh, by circumstances. Mm-hmm. So it's in some ways it is like... Uh, anarcho anarcho socialist propaganda maybe where it's like the the system is broken there's absolutely nothing we can do the only thing we can do is violence yeah so it's like okay i understand now well and like i haven't delved and deep, that's a criticism of the movie deep me. into the the psychology of incels or stuff but i i can imagine that a lot of it i know that it was this was true with shooters is they want notoriety they want to go out like known and seen and done right. and like that's this movie kind of is like, hey, this is the way to be yeah. seen, to become well, deified they wanna, they and immortalized. Go out, they want to go out known and seen because they want to send a message that like, this is the only thing I could do. Yeah. The system is so broken and all the Chads are getting all the Stacys and I can't do anything. So the only thing I can do is draw attention to this issue <clears throat> by I, killing myself. I just yeah. did some Googling to make sure, but when you said who would want to emulate the Joker, and well, in 2008, there was that shooter right. who went into a Dark Knight theater right, and, there was, and the, he colored his hair green and uh, said to Red? law enforcement, uh, green, green eye, okay. Okay. And, and said to law enforcement that he was the Joker. Well, and I think we all. Oh, no, you're right. He dyed his hair red. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I just saw the like photo. Like Ronald McDonald, a dangerous role model for <laughs> children everywhere. Well, <laughs> and people were talking about the danger of like making the Joker seem cool after the Dark Knight came out. Yeah. And now we have. The villains are always cool, though. They have to be. 
Right, but like I feel like the Dark Knight. So like that's a situation where okay, that guy had a mental situation, and this movie maybe tipped him over the edge. You can't avoid that, right? Like because the movie, the movie didn't glorify the Joker by any means. The movie, any like most, the vast majority. We're talking ninety nine percent of people watch the Dark Knight, and they're like. I don't want to be the Joker. I know that the Joker is the bad guy and doing that is wrong and I won't do it. But you want to be him for some, Halloween. Some percentage of people, sure. Some percentage of people are going to watch it and and have pre-existing conditions that are worsened by it and you mm. know like you can't really avoid that, but I think that like the Joker just it's it's even more irresponsible with the the uh subject matter. I'll say that. I you think know, it's more the Joker movie than the Dark Knight. But I, I, it's still not like horribly yeah, like whatever. Yeah. I just mean that. As I think long most, as we're talking about I think ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people watch it and are like, "Wow, what a fucking pathetic sure. figure who found himself." Yeah. But then there's always that liars of the, people the that are really that dangerous. The fact that he's not, he doesn't really resemble the comics Joker bothers me more than the fact that mm. maybe someone's gonna be nitpick or hitpick here. I remember on the first watch, the scene where he doesn't kill Gary, kills that other guy. Um, I remember that being like unnecessary. I was like, why did he just have to kill that guy randomly? Uh, and then I was thinking last night, like, is this scene narratively necessary? And that's like a question I posed to you. Because I guess we're coming off of him having been hiding in the fridge, which I heard that uh, was improv. That scene's mm. awesome when he mm. empties out the fridge and just gets in it. Um, good. You're coming from that and you're about to go to the show where he has to be, or you're about to go to him dancing on the stairs and everything. Right. So he has, to, the tone has to shift in that way. Yeah. So I guess this scene where he murders that guy accomplishes that. And if you removed it, you, you're kind of going from a depressive state to a manic state with no transition. I don't yeah. know. What do you guys think? Did you think that I think like... he already kind of was manic at that point. He was, he was hyping himself up to go on the show and, and murder, and murder, will kill himself. Yeah. But I think that even like the killing himself was... It's like part depression, part depression, part mania. And I think that him at that point, because he knows that he's going to kill himself, he knows that nothing matters. He's not worried about killing Randall and like the ramifications yeah. of that. He's like, I don't care about getting arrested. I'm about to kill myself. I think that scene works for me a lot, too, because it's a it's a crime of opportunity. Like he doesn't go planning, looking for for him. It's the guy comes to his house is like, hey, like, what did you say about the gun? Like, we got to we got to get our stories lined up, buddy. You're my boy. You're my yeah. boy. And it's like that's he's cracked. But now he has the opportunity. And then that's, I think, what informs his decision. Hey, killing isn't so bad. Like, instead of killing myself, let's let's, yeah. let's push it out. Yeah. Once he once he probably like gets a little bit of a because he gets more powerful feeling yeah. uh, from from killing Randall. I don't know if it's like narratively necessary, but I know that it really helps his characterization and the progression from. Yeah. being Arthur Fleck to the Joker. Mm-hmm. And it makes a, it makes it more deplorable, which is yeah. what we need. All right, I think we pretty much hit it, hit it here. Yeah. Let's move into another s- section of the show we're calling Free Time. Free, free time. time! It's time to be free. Uh, <laughs> free time, man! <laughs> uh, oh, free falling. Free. I get it. Uh, so I want to use my free time just to give some fan service to acknowledge how awesome the community has been. Yeah. Um, We've had fans from like day one who've seen it all and been with us and like replied to every damn tweet and like, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. you guys have been amazing. I wish it, there were more of you, but you've been dope. It's yeah. been like, it's been so like, uh, surprisingly nice. This would not have happened for as long as it did if we didn't have like, like the show is literally is like beloved. It actually is beloved. You guys are great. So thank you for being we, that Honestly, way. I think we were... Like, okay, that sounds weird maybe, but I think we were a little surprised when the reaction to us announcing the end of the show was so strong. Like I, I, I knew like, that would happen. I'm not, I'm not saying that like, you know, we didn't think anyone cared about the show, I guess, but like in, in, you know, part of the reason that we made this decision to end it was because compared to all the other stuff that we're doing uh, as part of LMG, this is a relatively minor property right it's not like a keystone of the of the lmg you know pyramid yeah and so we're like okay it doesn't really make sense to continue this anymore i i didn't expect such a strong reaction i did because i read the emails Mm -hmm. and there's been emails over the years of people saying like you know i was recovering i was stuck to a hospital bed or i'm in a wheelchair and like 
or I drive a lot or my job is really boring. And like the only thing that gets me through this thing in my life is I just is listening to hours and hours of you guys talk or I don't have, I moved to a new place and I don't have friends to share this with anymore. And I'm friends with you guys when I listen to this and it's like going to the movies with my buddies. And so uh, I'm happy that you guys have felt that way and shared it with yeah, us. Yeah, it was like, mm-hmm. it was, it was surprising in a, heartwarming way it's like i didn't know that i was that good friends with someone and then all of a sudden they say they really care about me and give me a hug yeah you know it was like oh okay cool and i wish that we had <laughs> you know for most podcasts like this are not attached to a thing like we are mm-hmm. and they can they can do things like have like meetups and like I would love to like go to the movies with you guys. I would love to do <laughs> live so viewings fun. of movies and like have people in the chat and just like do live commentary, like mystery science theater style. I would love to have had meetups with you guys and, and met y'all. Maybe I'll see you guys at, at um, LTX. Yeah, we should record an episode at LTX or something. Ooh. I don't know if there's like a Or do some kind of movie related something. Something. That yeah. would be fun. We should do that. But thanks you guys. Thanks yeah. for being fans. Yeah. Really appreciate you. And uh, particularly Matthew Noonan. Shout out. Matt, you're always sending us these awesome letters with like penmanship and you sent me a shirt. You sent me a Blade Runner 2049 shirt, everyone. I tweeted about it. It's He's, awesome. He sent he sent over this 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 four volume uh collection of Star Wars basically lore books. Personalized gifts to each yeah. of us. On Twitter he wrote that like this one for Riley as a thanks for always being the lore head. Hope it adds to the lore of the beloved bank of Star Wars knowledge. And then he like sent some other gifts as well for you guys, and like thank you, Matt. You're yeah. the, the What thank the heck? Matt. What a guy! You're the best. I got. What did you get? I got a gift not from Matt, from Jessica. I won't say your last name. From the UK, and I, I, uh, I'll open it this way. So uh, thank you for three years of TJM. Keep doing what you're doing. Hat. <laughs> 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 Never stop. But do what you love. Cheers, mate. And uh, it's a signed script of Scott Pilgrim. Whoa! So it's got like David's favorite yeah. film. Uh, Edgar Wright, Michael Sarah. I can't. Uh, it's Mary, signed. Yeah, it's autographed by like seven people. By, uh, yeah, I don't know who all the signatures are. How Mary, did they get it? Mary Elizabeth Winstead. It looks like. Wow. So this thank cool. you so much. This is the coolest thing that, I've ever gotten from th- a fan ever. That is, is so, so cool. Sick. Do you wow. want to hold it? I can give it back to. Di- yeah, feel the. I'll, uh, I'll open it up too because it looks like there's art inside. But uh, yeah, shout out, shout out to all the fans. That's Feels amazing. Like great. great fans. Um, I'm sorry I didn't reply. I replied to like literally every email we ever received, but a lot of the replies were just like the auto generated. Thanks. I'll check it out. And like (laughs) things that, (laughs) or like copy paste. But every time, I mean, when you made the like macro that auto sends that out, you were really like feeling the warmth. I read you. I read them all. I read every single email from an Indian fan who wanted us to cover Gangs of Wasapar. Oh, man. All hundreds, hundreds of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch it. We actually almost got close to watching, to covering that movie. That it was, was just on so the list. long. Yeah. It's yeah. such a long film that we we're like, ugh. We really had to kind of like narrow down the potential list of movies, uh, especially nearing the end here. But uh, I've kind of, I'm happy with with the ones that we covered. And I think we did a pretty, have a pretty good body of work. Like it would be worth revisiting if you ever wanted to in a couple of years. I want to. Yeah. I think because I've listened to even like days after we recorded, I listened to them. Oh, know, yeah. Sometimes I'm surprised. I'll be like, oh, I forgot I said that. Or like, oh, Riley said that. I actually wasn't listening. That's a good point. Right. That that <laughs> happens to me all the time. Like I often listen to them like a day or two after we release. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, oh, I was looking something up at this point where they were having that conversation. And I had no <laughs> idea that they brought that up. Only for me to like ask 30 seconds later, wait, what scene is this again? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's happened. <laughs> we should also thank the guests we've had. Yeah. Brandon, Bell, Sarah. Obviously, Sarah. Oh, man. But we even had like random one offs like Mark. Yeah. Uh, Plu. Oh, Linus yeah. Mark. Twice, two yeah, when, when, when uh, James was gone Wasn't for a few Adam weeks. there once? Yeah. Adam so. was on. Luke, Dan yeah. Besser was on. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully Luke was on for hackers. Oh, and then we also had like random other guests. Sarah. Well, obviously, we have oh, to yeah. say we, Sarah. We did obviously. say Sarah. No, but we, we had, I think, twice we had. Um, we had the screenwriter from Luca. That was cool. Oh, What's yeah. that guy's name? Michael Stevens or something like that? Oh, Dang it. Shoot. And we had, uh, of course, Kurt that looks pretty Hamilton bad. from um, <laughs> Triple Kirk Click. Hamilton. Ploof was on. Yep. We said that. <laughs> hey, it's happening again. Oh, you, oh, you already said listening. Ploof? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was looking through. I was looking at the thumbnails. Yeah. Do you guys feel like you've had 
to put it in stupid. no mike jones is his name mike remember jones. mike jones yeah yeah, yeah 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 that guy was awesome he was awesome okay. that was probably my favorite episode to to participate unfortunately in such a yeah treat. i wish we could have done more guest things but it's not having people here was the biggest thing like yeah. you guys i know other people wanted us to have a certain guests but if we were in la we could do that but how many people are in vancouver and the ones that are like yeah it could be cool to have seth rogan or ryan reynolds but i don't even know how to contact those yeah. people man yeah mm. Never yeah. got there. It's crazy times. Do you guys feel like you grew as hosts and or people hosting the podcast over two, three years, three years? How long has it been? Uh, it's Maybe been, three. It's been three. That I, we started in the, well, yeah. 2019. 19, 19, 20, 21, 23. It it definitely grew 20, as a three podcaster. Years. It's been three years. Definitely grew as a podcaster. Oh, pod. for there's, sure. There's no Man, way. Listen to the first one. It was so cringe. <laughs> How many episodes do you think there have been then? So Like, like 150? I don't think quite that many because we broke it into two seasons based on when the set changed. Um, and I think we were at like 50, 60 in the first season and then 69. This is the 69th episode Shut of the second up, season. We did this not one plan is? it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then we joked about making this season three, episode one. And just <laughs> ending oh, it yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, yeah. Oh, no, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of hours. Yeah. It is. It's not, it's not ten thousand hours, but do you guys have like a memory of like what your favorite movie to talk about was? I uh, uh, there's a few good ones. I feel like Truman Show might be the best yeah, episode ever. One. Uh, one of the funnest episodes was that freaking um, Event Horizon. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> oh, the God. Cats episode. I almost want. I think we the should cats. make a, a best cats of episode playlist. Was great. Yeah, I think we could probably make a playlist of fifteen episodes yeah. that are just they, stellar. Some of the some of the best episodes are ones where we go see the movie and it's like a so bad it's good situation, or yeah. like it's not even good. It's just so bad, and we're just like making fun of it the whole Do little episode. Sucks. Oh yeah. my god! But I think the cats one in particular. We were laughing and laughing. The, oh, the cats so was funny. great. Yeah. I mean, the butthole cut, the whole like discussion. <laughs> But I think yeah, I hated Event Horizon. Favorite movie? I think we <laughs> talked about probably everything ever all at once for me. You oh, did Scott Pilgrim as well. That was probably, yeah. probably and that's one of our top performing episodes I ever too, it. which is so bizarre. I think it has to do with hyping something up before you watch it. That's and people fair. people wanting to watch it because they know you love it. Yeah, because Dune did well as well for that. I think that partly yeah. that very reason. Yeah, Blade Runner did pretty well too. Yep. Dark Knight. Man. Um, probably my favorite. I it feels kind of cheap to say because we did so many super good episodes after that but like the first few episodes we did about star wars and the rise of skywalker mm. those are really really fun for me just I because agree. i had so many i had so many thoughts i needed therapy i need star wars mm. therapy that reminds me do you guys have any um and it and it helped do you have any um regrets or like i have some shame episodes oh. I, have, I have some worst ofs like i'm pretty sure uh, my parasite take which is like one of the first 10 we did i think I was just like oh, totally yeah. wrong. I like uh, didn't yeah. get the movie. Yep. I think I have that a couple times. Kind of happened on a Babadook a little bit. Didn't get that one, even though I was like trying my hardest to get it. Just too dumb. I have some shame over. Uh, oh, and spirit. my Star Wars takes. My Star Wars takes. Mm. You were just oh, I mean, Rise of Skywalker. We, you like Rise oh, of Skywalker? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I was, came back the next day watching. That. I was like, oh, that was pretty good. But like, <laughs> I don't. I don't blame you so much for that because there's a lot of people that liked the Rise of St yeah. Skywalker. So I'm not like, I'm not like and. I, I don't think well I do think less of you if you like it. But well, you just weren't engaged. I, I, with I didn't the... love it though. Like I knew that like the pacing of it and like they're just mm -hmm. they're here they're there they're everywhere kind of was not that great. But it was at least it... understandable. Yeah. Um. I think I have a tendency to just like over like movies when I, I see them in the theater and I walk out of them sure. like hyped up. That's yeah, uh, experience. Yeah. They get like an extra one point five. Yeah, I was I remember going back to the theaters. That was a big deal. Even Tenant, I didn't love that movie, but. It was just nice to be at the theater again. Right, right, right. Like I miss. I I love the theater. We've gone through a that lot was of this the other, podcast. Yeah, right? that was the other thing we didn't. Even, we haven't like we for a long time. Oh we God. were we were recording with plexiglass <laughs> barriers. Yeah, because we didn't even know. Like this was early days of the pandemic. People didn't even know what we were dealing with. Like yeah. people, is it airborne? Is it not? Yeah. But, and, and we didn't want to wear masks. We did eventually wear masks. We for eventually lots of recordings. wore masks for, for months, a couple, many yeah. months. Sucked. Oh, really? Was it many months? I think it was like close to a year of yeah. podcasts. Well, because we podcast. because we had to wear them at work, and they Everyone. were like, "Why it doesn't make any sense for you to take them off?" Just because we were allowed to for a while, though. For a while, we were. Yeah, Maybe knows. it wasn't close to a year. I've, it was at least like five months. And then at the something. beginning of the podcast, we planned to only do new movies, go to the theater every week, yeah. right. and then because of the pandemic, we couldn't, and that's oh, yeah. when we started yeah. doing old movies more. Yeah. So, we, but that was good for viewers because again and again we heard like, "I can't go to the theater every week. I'd right. rather." It's watch been sort of one. a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, 
I'm sort of ashamed of my takes about anime uh, early on when we did we <laughs> Spirited did Spirited Away. Away. I stand by mine. Nah, <laughs> well, take it back. Take so it like, back. <laughs> I, after having watched a bunch of Studio Ghibli movies and watched them with my kid, I understand now. I get it. Like He's I had the wrong. But like, and people told me this, like when we did Spirited Away, they were like, you're looking at it the wrong way. Like, it's not supposed to be like this hero's journey or whatever. It's just supposed to be a vibe. Yeah. You're just supposed to chill and just be like, wow, that's a beautiful thing. Wow. That's an emotion. Wow. Mm. And it's and so like, and that's what the movies are about. They're less about like this roller coaster yeah. and more about just kind of like a bunch of things happen and it's a vibe. I kind of wish we had done Grave of the Fireflies. That's a great movie. It's too sad. I don't need any more sadness. Any movies life. you guys wish we did? I really wanted to do Casablanca. I think that that's a movie. It's obviously well regarded and stuff, but a lot of people don't watch it because it's like a black and white movie, but it feels so modern and I think it lands really well today. I'm, uh, I am I think we could have had a good discussion on that one. I, I was like, I have never seen it. So I was like, that should that would be a good way to like fill in that blank in my historical cinema knowledge. But well, it covers a lot, right? I don't think we did anything pre 70s. No. Did we? I don't think so. Because old movies are boring. Mostly. No, no, we did um, <laughs> 2001 Space Odyssey. That's 60s, yeah. I'm That's so, about it. I'm so glad we did an we episode have, on Severance. I feel like we have a bunch of... Yeah, that was good. That was a great episode, yeah. There's a bunch of movies we could recommend. I don't know what the best way to do it is. Maybe on Twitter or something, but like more Kubrick movies. That, like I went all on a Kubrick them. cook once, kick, and they're all good, man. Like Paths of Glory is good. Spartacus. Um, Barry Lyndon is good. I haven't seen Spartacus, it's actually. Mm, I am Spartacus. Um, well, we Doctor Strange Love is wicked. Yeah. Should probably we got to wrap this up we have places to be yeah, unfortunately yeah could sit here it's all day why we're ending the stopping the podcast because <laughs> we got stuff to do um i, I want to say my shame and it's oh, yeah. both uh, what's that note prestige and the fountain and i stand by my opinions <laughs> but i could have been a lot more chill about it <laughs> those were tense those I were tense mad, episodes but yeah. I, was, I think that was pre-medicated david so oh, that's okay. full manic depression david so your 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 opinions are justified yeah it was just the presentation i'm yeah. glad our yeah. candy man episode had technical difficulties and never went out i don't think that was a good one either the candy man oh yeah that yeah i think when when we recorded that one and then like the the data the data got corrupted or something we were yeah. like that's okay. That's for the best. It wasn't a great episode. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Movie, though. It's um, been great, y'all. Yeah, thank we you so much. We love you guys. Thank oh, you so much Oh, we never ended up watching. watching or reacting to uh, the original Joker clip. Well, it's on Floatplane. Subscribe, <laughs> bitches. Yeah, I mean, it, it is still on Floatplane. Now you have a direct comparison if you if you want to. Uh, yeah, what is That'd it? be a fun Floatplane exclusive, just like reacting to yeah. that. I don't know. It's not going to happen. Or, no, it's not. But Maybe we'll anyways. come back for big movies. I think that'd be we fun. We have a lunch in there to go to and there's pizza. We do. So. I don't want to. James, James said maybe not, but maybe we will come back to do like really big movies, to. just like once or twice a year. The we'll next see. Avengers or we'll something. See. You don't have to yeah, say anything. It'll James. just be on our own time. But yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, I yeah. Don't unsubscribe. There, no, there was a couple. I, I I said that shit, and then like I'll see a trailer, and I'm like, I would want to talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I watched Knives Out. I want to talk about it so. Oh, bad. there's Knives Out. One thing mm. I wish that we could have covered is the whale. It looks yeah. really good. I know. Anyways, well, I'm going to keep doing it. Timer. I'm going to do movies on my own channel. I'm doing a podcast with Jono. We'll see how that goes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, we got all the gear. We're doing our first episode tonight. Really? Yeah, Good it'll, for be, you. it'll be interesting. We actually still don't know. It hasn't been even discussed at all about what's going to happen to this property. If yeah. Like, yeah. Will it just be a dormant piece of LMG? Will it be given to us? Yeah. Don't we know. don't know. We, we don't haven't know. discussed amongst ourselves what yeah. we want. We haven't discussed uh, with Linus about what's possible. Right. Yeah. We just don't know, we guys. We just don't know. Until we figure that out, I might just do stuff on my personal channel, too. I don't know. We'll see. See you later. Three, two, one. All right, Three, love you guys. Two, see you later. Subscribe to Carpal Critics. Love you so much. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Hey, guys, and welcome to the first episode of a new movie podcast that... I guess. James, you say your name now. You say, <laughs> Riley. He's, you son of a... <laughs> <laughs> Every episode is going to be like this. I know it. Uh, it's James. It's David. It's Riley. That's me. I'm Riley. We're talking movies now. Yep. The working title for this podcast is Retcon 1. We don't know if we're going to keep that. Don't know how I feel about it. It sounds cool. But... We can always go back and change the title. It's a technical term. And us being technicians... We figured, hmm, let's talk about what we know.
<laughs> Starting with the Joker. This first episode is going to be about the Joker, a movie mm-hmm. that David saw apparently a month ago. It's already been like at least two weeks since I saw it. What's the difference? <laughs> it's, not fresh on your, it's not fresh on your mind. It's fresh on my mind. Well, when did you see it? I haven't stopped thinking about it. <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> All right. So you guys want to start with going around the table and giving it a rating out of 10? Oh, we could do that. 